Okay, we want to start today. As you can see, I will stick to these uh, things there, to these um, sentences which I wrote down for you, um, because then you can look it up at home later on and you know what we, what we did, because, uh, you know, um, it's good to have it together. Um, the uh, theme which we have is from having to being. Now, having we all know, but, but being is, that's another question. So that's what we want to find out how to let go and to let be. And this is something from the great master Eckhart. And I don't know if you ever heard of him, but he is one of the most influential thinkers of the late Middle Ages. And he reaches here into our present, to, to our psychologists, to Siggy Jung and Eric Fromm and so on. And so we want to concentrate on master Eckhart because he was the greatest which we had, uh, whom we had in this late uh, Middle Ages, and maybe he could have um, held Christianity together so that the Reformation would not have become the disintegration of Christianity. So, and he, uh, Luther, knew him well, and uh, many Protestant thinkers as well, so uh, that is what we want to concentrate on. Now, Master Eckhart, of course, is rooted, like all Christian thinking, in the um, Hebrew Bible and also in the New Testament. And so we want to start out with the reading, a very simple reading, and there will be three. I don't know which one will be the fourth one. But uh, what Eckhart creates is a creation theology, a theology which takes creation seriously and not only redemption or so. So he enjoys the world in a certain sense. It is created by God. And then that is the first chapter of Genesis. The other thing which his thinking is based on is the first chapter of John's Gospel. In the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God was the Word, and the Word was God, and then the Incarnation, and the Word became flesh. First everything was created um, through the Word, and then the Word itself became flesh. That is the uh, core of Christianity, and there we have discussions with our Jewish brothers and sisters and with our Islamic brothers and sisters and here we have an Islamic brother with us, that is Dustin, my faithful follower who is doing his PhD, but he is already a professor yeah. and teaching. Where? Oliver College. Oliver College, okay. So, uh, so and then uh, number three, we will um, take something from the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor and so on. Because obviously that poor has something to do with having or not having or being or not being. So if that sounds a little peculiar to you now, just leave it there for a moment. That is our task that slowly we, we clear it up. So I just want to read a few verses here. This is well known to all of us. So Eckhart has a, is a mystic, of course, whatever that is. And uh, he has a mystical theology of creation. And uh, then we will see what he does with this. But that is our point today with which we want to start. So he starts with this. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now the earth was a formless and void. There was darkness over the deep, and God's spirit ho ho hovered over the water there. Master Eckhart would say, there is God there. And then he speaks, and there is the word. And then there is the spirit. So. Christians very often have read the Hebrew Bible in a Trinitarian way, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they find it already in the first, uh, the first lines. Now, if the rabbis are very happy about this, you have to visit them, and that's what we do. We visit them all the time. I take my glasses to the imams and to the rabbis, and then we talk about this. So the second one is God said. See, there is always this God said, God said, so that is what is taken up by John. In the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God was the Word, the Word was God, and so on. It all was created. So there is a connection between John's Gospel, it's the latest of the Gospels, and the first chapters of the Hebrew Bible. We don't want to say the Old Testament, because then our rabbi brothers are not very happy. They don't want to be old. They want to be new too. So then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that light was good, and the creation was good, and God divided light from darkness. God called light day, and darkness he called night. Evening came, and morning came the first day. God said, and there it is again, let there be a vault 
in the waters to divide the waters in two, and so it was. God made the vault, and it divided the waters above the vault from the waters under the vault. God called the vault heaven. Evening came, and morning came, and so on. Now, does Master Eckhart take that verbally, literally? No. So I ask this question because we have these strong Protestant and Catholic and Islamic and Jewish fundamentalism in our country, which is connected also with, um, with, with uh, political fundamentalism. And so let's say about the reading, how we read this. Master Eckhart has a, some kind of a spiritual meaning of this, not a literary one. How do people get to this? How does one become a fundamentalist? There's nothing bad about a fundamentalist. A fundamentalist is a modern man. A modern man who has been shocked by the Enlightenment. Uh, that means by the middle class Enlightenment and by the Marxist Enlightenment, by the Freudian Enlightenment. And uh, so he loses his hold. He is afraid that he would lose his hold. And therefore, when he is shocked and he cannot give norms to his children anymore and tell them what direction and what is good and what is bad, then he flees backward to the religion of the fathers. And he thinks the religion of the fathers, that's of course the prophets and, the, um, and the, these writings here of the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, he thinks that they all thought it was meant it all literally. So they somehow misunderstand that. But that is not our point. Our point is to understand why somebody becomes a fundamentalist. Because in the right way to go would be to go to, through the Enlightenment and come out on the other side with a second naivete. And one could have a much deeper view of religion if one had gone through it. But they are frightened to go through it. And therefore they are fleeing back and then involve themselves in all kinds of contradictions. Uh, because, um, like, let's say the Jehovah's Witnesses are not using blood or whatever, the Bible said this, and we have it also with other things, homosexuality and so on. <laughs> the, um, they cut out the context in which this was said, and therefore uh, become very fixed. And then out of this come these culture wars, some of which maybe are not necessary. We have a culture war every day. Now we have the gun control, and then we have the contraception before, and then we have stem cell research, and then we have homosexual marriages, and so on. Every day there is another one. And um, if you take a fundamentalist position, that sharpens, of course, the, the controversy. And you know that our culture and our society and our people are torn between these two things, that religious on one side and then the secular on the other side. We will talk about it as we come. So this is our reading for today. And the next time we will go to John and then we will go to Matthew and look at this blessed are the poor. And then uh, at last we will go to the, um, the eschatology, that means book of Revelation, maybe the last chapter. This will be our four readings and our four meetings which we have. So now in our 88th theological discourse, and it should be a theological discourse, let me say something about this. We ha cannot have theology on this campus, as you know. This is a state university. My predecessor was Father Harden, a Jesuit, and he was fired. So because it is against the First Amendment, um, the uh, state does not, uh, cannot support uh, uh, the theology of a particular group, of a particular Christian paradigm, be it Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Protestants, or whatever. Um, the state has to be neutral, uh, the state has to protect entrance of religious people into the public sphere, but they must not, it must not come so far that the state takes sides in a certain way. And so, therefore, we have, instead of theology, which is the talk about God, we have religiology, that is the talk about religion. That is our comparative religion department, which I'm a member of almost since 50 years. So um, the, uh, we tried it in the beginning to make it a theology department. Um, there were some uh, Presbyterians who planned this, but uh, it fell apart. It was, could not uh, hold in, in a state university. So you have to go to a private university in order to have uh, theology. 
So we don't think we know anything about theology. Our civil religion is deistic. We only know that God has created the world, but then he left. And uh, so the world, by all measures, is uh, atheistic, and God is worldless. That is neither Muslim, nor Jewish, nor Christian, but that is our civil religion. We have the name of God. It's not in the Constitution, but it is in the Declaration of Independence. And in the Declaration of Independence, God is the deistic God, which has been constructed by Voltaire and Rousseau in the French bourgeois enlightenment, the middle class enlightenment. So, so we want to have a theological discourse. That means we do not want simply to say, and we cannot in terms of Eckhart. Eckhart was not an agnostic. Eckhart thought he knew something about God. He does not talk much about religion. He may be even very critical of religion but he knows a lot about God. So his German sermons, they are very famous, uh, are all about God. And that is very unusual in our atmosphere, uh, which we have in our cultural atmosphere. So this is what we want to start. And this is the 88th theological discourse. Let me tell you something about that too. I grew up in Nazi Germany, and you will see a little trailer there. Uh, it will be in there. And so I was a member of the Catholic Youth Movement, and uh, so I uh, was very much involved in the fighting. Uh, the first um, Catholic youth movement was allowed because the Pope had made a concordat with Hitler, which allowed the Catholic youth movement to exist. But then uh, the more time went on, Hitler did not honor his concordat, which, by the way, today is still valid in the German Republic, the Federal Republic. So, um, and nevertheless, the, my leaders were beaten up, some were killed, and they were tortured to such an extent that we could not even open up the, the coffins. So, uh, and I saw the Catholic Church in struggle, struggle with the modern world, with the fascist society, and I was deeply impressed by this, and I am still uh, impressed by it, and, and uh, uh, think of the people who, who carried on this struggle. So. When the war was over, there were many Catholics and Protestants too in Germany who said, why didn't you tell us what a fascist state is? Why didn't you tell us what that means to go from liberalism to fascism and so on? You didn't tell us. And so at that time I, take a, I take, took a vow, well, I shouldn't take a vow at all, it's forbidden by the New Testament. As you know, the strange thing, the bishop, just, uh, not the bishop, the president put his hand on three Bibles this time and took a vow which all three Bibles forbid. The third commandment of the Sermon on the Mount says, don't take any vow. Say yes, yes, no, no. What is more than that is from the evil one. It's from Satan. But they don't care about what is in the Bible, just the covers. They had beautiful covers there in which the Bible <laughs> were present. So maybe they should. We do that in the courts also to all the time. So uh, maybe we should look into it sometimes. Eckhart, Look into it. So him we want to follow. But nevertheless, I took some kind of a vow and uh, said, I will do everything in order to uh, talk to the people as much as I can so that they are not surprised or whatever when some strange things are happening, that they are prepared for this and so that they can stand up or can prevent what will happen or whatever. So the transition from uh, uh, liberalism to fascism, or from liberalism to socialism, uh, whatever may happen, that people are prepared for this, as believers prepared for this, and Catholics were not, and Protestants were not. Hitler marched with three million men into Russia and killed 70 million Russians, and all these three million were baptized Catholics and Protestants. That is a catastrophe, as our some of our elections in recent years were also a catastrophe. Okay, so nevertheless, that is why I have done this, and this is the 88th, and you are making history because you are making it possible, because otherwise, Dustin and I, we would have gone to the roadhouse instead and would have eaten our cookies there. But I'm so happy that you're here and you made this possible. That is unbelievably beautiful. Okay, so we want to tell, talk about these mystics, about this mystic there. Sometimes, you know, in the university, mystical is a bad thing. And you have to be scientific, and mystical is the opposite of scientific. That's a great misunderstanding, of course. So let me say 
for a moment what that means, that mystic thing. Um, all three Abrahamic religions, and we want to really be open here, we want to get out of the parochial boundaries, we want to include our Jewish brothers and our Islamic brothers and our Buddhist brothers and so on. We want to talk in an ecumenical way and not in a narrow um, um, way as it uh, unfortunately happens sometimes. So um, nevertheless, mysticism is not part of the Abrahamic religions. The Abrahamic religions are not mystical. They always, when you hear Abraham talk or Moses or even Jesus or Mohammed, they stand before God, they before his face and so on, and then pray. But the mystic is someone tries to be in God, and God is in him, and he is in God, and so on. So that is very strange, and it comes from, uh, from the East. It comes from the East, from the Eastern religions. Um, from them we have that mystical element, we have the monastical element, the monk uh, thing, and we have also asceticism uh, to uh, somehow to conquer our um, natural being in order to become good and so on. Like we have it with the Gautama, the Buddha, who uh, um, nailed himself, his natural being, his will to life with the um, component, with the libidinous component and with the aggressive, the killer instinct which we see on television all the time. There's not a day when one guy was shot, the day the guy was shot to had stolen this little boy and had killed the driver of the bus and so on. So it's not so this killer instinct in us, and it is in us. You know, we're peaceful people, but uh, we don't know what's in there. A lot of stuff is unconscious, and so also the libidinous thing, the sexual thing, the porno civilization and so on. So um, the, the asceticism meant then to, in a certain sense, to kill the will to life by removing the images. And that is what the monks took over. There's only one order in the Orthodox Church, uh, the Basilius order, but they have this asceticism. So when you go to Mount Athos, for instance, where the, uh, the Orthodox monks are, there's an elevator and nothing female is allowed to come up there. No milk, no eggs, no cows, no women, nothing. In order to deprive the will to life of images which feed them. But our television does all day long, it feeds that will to life all the time. And uh, so therefore you will see what our Master Eckhart has to say about having and being is very different from our civilization. And we don't want to condemn it or whatever, that's not our purpose. We want to see if he can heal us because it's not normal that we kill all these children all the time. It's not normal that we have killed one million people in Iraq or today. Yesterday, a guy, a, a, a sharpshooter, who had killed 150 Iraqis by sharpshooting, was shot himself in a shooting ramp there uh, somewhere. So um, the, uh, this is too much. This is not healthy. This is not normal. So we ask, uh, the, uh, he had a great influence, Eckhart, on psychoanalysts uh, and on sociologists and on cultural studies people. And so we want to have that perspective if he can help us in the situation. So on one side, we will see to what extent our culture is a having culture. We will even have a funny movie there, which is about other people's money. Money is that having thing there, and it's all over the place. And if that has something to do with our, uh, with our illness and what we see on television all the time, so, nevertheless, we will see and we will be open. But mysticism comes from the East. And why did it come in? See, you have the Sufis in Islam, but they are not really in it. You have Master Eckhart in Catholicism. You have Jakob Böhme, a Protestant mystic in Protestantism. You have the Kabbalah and, and the Hasidim and so on in, in Judaism. And Everywhere these mystics uh, are somehow have a little precarious situation. Uh, they are tolerated, but uh, they are not really the mainstream uh, of, of the whole thing. So, um, but why did it come in anyway? When Master Eckhart, 1300 or so around this time, there were 1300 years that the Messiah had not come. That means it is that what we call the parousia delay. The delay of the parousia, and that is the delay of the coming return of Christ. 
So um, the, this parousia delay, all three Abrahamic religions have. Um, the, uh, uh, should we close this door there, or is it gravity for you, or uh, maybe? I mean, I like that everybody listens to us, but <laughs> they find it disturbing there. Um, so, so the parousia delay. Uh, I'm sorry about these Greeks. Greek words they pop up because Christianity was very Greek in the beginning. So and and so the Jewish people have waited now for 2,800 years, and the synagogue down on Stadium Drive, they are still uh, waiting for the Messiah. They think the Messiah never came, but he will still come. And then there are we, and we wait for 2,000 years already, and our Muslim brothers wait for 1,400 years now. For God's eyes, that may not be very long, but for us, it is very long. So, therefore, some people go on to believe in this coming, that every little uh, second, that every second can be a little gate through which the Messiah will enter, suddenly, as Jesus describes it, like a thief in the night or so. And not as a result of evolution or revolution or whatever, but it breaks in. The great uh, thinker Benjamin, Walter Benjamin, described that very intensely and so on. So now the mystics come in because it lasted so long. The Messiah didn't come. And so therefore they think maybe that we have to do what the Messiah wanted to do, that we can already now be close to God and God can be close to us. And we can be in God and God can be in us. And we don't have to wait another thousand years or whatever. And also that we ourselves can already do what the Messiah uh, will bring. The Messiah will be a king of peace. We can establish peace already. And then maybe in the end when the Messiah comes, then he only has to put his signature under what we have done already. And then you see there is only one step from these mystics into modernity. Then you have these enlighteners, the bourgeois enlighteners for which our constitution comes, and they try then and say, well, if he has to put only a signature underneath, we can do the rest uh, ourselves anyway. And then you have the socialistic ideas of the realm of freedom on the basis of the realm of necessity and so on. These are these modern projects which follow out of mysticism. So you have that step, these orthodox religions, they believe that the Messiah can come, but there is a parousia delay. The Messiah takes time, and uh, therefore they um, think they have to do it themselves, and they want to be close to God already now, and not just wait until heaven knows when. And then they also want to do the work, and from that the next step is into modernity, because that is what you experience all day long, is this antagonism between the religious on one side and the secular people who are struggling about all these issues from the morning to the night. Right? So the president says, well, about my homosexual brothers and lesbian sisters and so on. And then on the other side, there is this uh, agitation against that. That is, and uh, uh, we uh, um, are in the middle of this and we will not decide this. We want to see what the creation theology um, of Master Eckhart may have to say about this. Um, it's not only a matter of public opinion in the public sphere, the question is also what is true now in God's name. And the university doesn't even talk about truth anymore, they just talk about correctness. The correctness of protocol sentence, it snows now. Does it snow or not? Is it correct or not correct? But what Jesus taught, the truth, which would be the absolute truth, it's out. That means we have no theology department, which older universities had, and which Chicago University still has, and in Baltimore and in Boston and so on, but not the normal universities, I would say, in this country. So, nevertheless, this is the reason why this um, why this uh, happened, and uh, so when we when he talks, when Eckhart talks so much about the poor and so on, that has something else to do. He lived in a feudal system. That means they were feudal lords who owned everything, including their serfs. It was better than slavery. So Christianity um, developed under slave. It was an unbelievable rebellion against slavery. 
and an attempt to overcome that by changing the people. So uh, Paul writes the letter to the sl slaveholder and says, I, your slave was with me all these years and I will pay you for him. But now treat him differently because you have become a, a Christian yourself and this slave is your brother now. You cannot t deal with him as a slave anymore and so on. So, um, uh, so this, uh, the, uh, uh, the mystical theology does not take place under slavery anymore but in the Middle Ages it takes place under the feudal lords. So it takes sides, as Christianity did from the very beginning, not with the slaveholders, but with the slaves. Not with the feudal lords, but with the serfs. And then comes the great bourgeois revolution, and the third estate wins over the first estate, which is the clergy, and the second estate, which is the noble man. Now we will have a new king in Denmark, you know, in Holland we will have a new king. So there are little kings around, but they are a little bit like fairy tale figures, and uh, their marriages will be celebrated and so on. But they have lost all far power. These are constitutional monarchs, which have uh, absolutely are just paid for in order to look good and to be a symbol of national unity. But they have no they have the shadow of whatever a king once was. Okay, so that is, we have to see that Eckhart, when he sides with the poor that there is something, uh, has something to do with the environment, with the context. So his texts are in a context. Now, Master Eckhart belonged to an order. He belonged to the Dominican order. He was even had a high rank in the Dominican order in Thuringia. Uh, Thuringia was the same province in which Martin Luther grew up. So, um, and, um, so the, uh, the, uh, the Dominican order was a beggar order. That means it was on the side of the beggars. They had no private property. They were communists, like these monks up here in Three Rivers, which are Anglican uh, Benedictines. They're also communists. So, and there was another order which came up at the same time, and that is the Franciscans. And the Franciscans and the Dominicans were struggling with each other. There were two beggar orders. And the most radical was St. Francis. He was more radical than his brother Dominicus. Dominicus didn't leave anything behind in terms of writing, but St. Francis left a lot behind. And St. Francis is the first rebellion against early capitalism. That means the transition from feudalism to capitalism. Not the first estate and the second estate rule the society, but the third estate rules the society. And whom do they rule? The fourth estate, our 200 million workers in this country, who do not want to be called workers, they want to be called middle class, and that confuses the whole thing all the time. So that is, these are the big orders. And what did Franz Francis do? And Dominican was very close to that. One day, St. Francis went to the marketplace in Assisi without any clothes on. Naked, he jumped around in the marketplace and the bishop had to run and put his blue viola, his raincoat, around him that he would not be totally naked. And then he took all what he had and threw it into the face of his father, who was one of the early businessmen, uh, the first bourgeoisie, which grew up slowly in the cities which were inside of the feudal systems. So the city of Mainz or the city of Cologne or whatever. And so the third estate, the bourgeoisie, grew up there and so Assisi was a little city like this, and there was a beginning of capitalism in northern Italy, also uh, in, in, in Holland and in southern Germany and so on. So that is slowly that the third estate rises, and as capitalism rises, you right away have this unbelievable opposition in the beggar orders in uh, St. Francis, and the Franciscans, and Dominicus, and Dominican order. And uh, this rebellion goes on and on and on up to into the present. Some of these liberation theologians, Central America and South Africa and so on, they come from these beggar orders. The, um, the, uh, St. Francis was so radical that he did not even want to have property for the order. And it was Innocence the third, the uh, f most powerful pope ever, um, who uh, imposed on him that he had to have property for the order because he said, what if somebody gets sick? And then the order has to take care of them. St. Francis went with a little plate there 
and went from house to house and begged and they put sauerkraut and pudding and everything on this and he died already when he was 34 years old from a stomach trouble. No wonder I have a stomach trouble today, so I feel with him. So this uh, uh, is, we want to make that clear where these people are standing. Now, we are a capitalistic country and we are the most capitalistic country ever. And uh, so we see that this, uh, uh, there will be an, an, an antagonism between the two. But we want to, wherever we are, we all are involved in capitalism, we all get a salary, I hope. And uh, so therefore we, we do not look down on other people or whatever. We just want to see if what is happening under this capitalism thing and how long it is supposed to go on with its crises and so on. And then we want to see if there is some wisdom coming to us from the past which maybe can guide us or help us in this situation. We need all the help we can possibly get. So um, therefore that is why we want to study this Meister Eckhart. I want to see what he, what he is all up to there. So um, he gave modern thinkers the teaching on having and being. That's where it comes from. So when you have the book uh, of Eric Fromm, a Jew, and says having and being, that's where it comes from. It comes from Meister Eckhart. And Meister Eckhart got it from the New Testament. And the New Testament got it from the, from the Torah. But the New Testament was much more radical than the Torah. And the um, Master Eckhart is as radical as the New Testament is. So the, the Christianity which we get uh, usually on Sunday and so on, it's a beautiful one. And I go for 50 years to this beautiful church here and so on. But uh, the, it is a little bit adjusted to, to reality. So when we would say to Father Ken, uh, you know, we have two places in the Acts which say that early Christianity was communistic. Then Father Ken would say dutifully that this was a little bit idealized. <laughs> and therefore, it is not really valid for us anymore and so on. So um, that is how we, uh, how, and, uh, how we have to do it probably. We are not saints, we are not heroes, we don't want to have that what I went through in Germany that martyrdom all over the place. We want to get along with the world as it is, at least to some extent without betraying at the same time what we really believe in. So, Pastor Eckhart influenced thinkers of the late Middle Ages and modernity and postmodernity up to now. He did not only shape modern theologians, philosophers, but also psychologists and sociologists. He has remained a bridge builder between Occident and Orient up to the present. Master Eckhart, when you take him together to the Taoists or take him together with the Buddhists or so, you would see they have a deep understanding with each other in their God talk, in their theology. Okay, now let me add something right away. Uh, when I planned this course and I always work together with the staff here and with Father Ken and, and the sisters, and then uh, I made it clear to them that uh, uh, Master Eckhart has been, a, has been set on the index by the church and I think that should be made clear. The interesting thing is that nobody cared about it, what the Roman uh, the Jews said, what the, uh, uh, what the authorities in Rome said, because the Jesuit founder, um, the uh, uh, um, Ignatius of Loyola and also Canisius, and we have Canisius colleges and Loyola colleges, etc. He learned from Master Eckhart, and he uh, did not bother about what, if he was forbidden or not. But the question is, why was he forbidden? There was first a trial of the Inquisition against Master Eckhart, and he defended himself. We have the defense writings by him. And he defended himself well, and the church was satisfied. The Inquisition was satisfied. And then he died, and after he, they, he died, they took up the uh, procedures again and then uh, sentenced him again, or not the first time really, and they never lifted it. So we have always suggested that Benedict XVI should finally lift it and so on, because it rests on an error. What is the error? Maybe we'll get to it uh, later on. What did the Inquisition make wrong? Uh, didn't see. Well, they charged him with pantheism. Pantheism means that nature and God are identical. In reality, what Master Eckhart preached was panentheism. It's just a tiny little word 
That is why the confusion came about. Panentimism means that all is one in God, and God is in all things, and things are all God. But that does not mean that there is no difference between them. That is the issue with pantheism. The difference is missing, and that is why the Roman authorities uh, misunderstood it. The difference is there. Uh, the uh, human soul comes very close to God, uh, but the human soul and God are never totally identical. And the same thing is with creation. They are very close. And when you read, you will see that um, Christianity is much closer to pantheism than it is, for instance, to deism. So St. Paul, when he spoke on the Areopark in Athens, made that clear. He quoted even uh, some pantheistic poets uh, of the Greeks and the Romans. And uh, so, but the, I just want to leave it there for the moment that it is high time that uh, Master Eckhart is, uh, he has been unbelievably productive outside of the church and also inside of the church and uh, people should ask why that is so and if maybe a mistake was made. Okay, so um, th this is what we want to say for a moment there then. Uh, in order to introduce myself a little bit with Dustin too, we want to have our little trailer there. Uh, we are still planning to uh, make a broader movie series in which we uh, develop our uh, thinking a little bit more and that trailer is the beginning of it. Now, do we have any questions about this? Please feel free to be critical and particularly when I mention some strange words and just say what is this strange word all about? Strange word to me was pausia delay. Pausia delay, yeah, yes. that's what I used before. Pausia is a Greek word and it means something like the arrival, the arrival of the Messiah. So the Christian community hoped that Jesus uh, was resurrected and that he went up to the Father and that he sits on the right side of the Father and that he will come again. That's what we say in the creed, uh, the creed every Sunday, right? So, that, but this hasn't happened yet. And um, the Jewish people always talk about a false alarm. So he was one of the false alarms and there were a lot of these false alarms, a lot of messiahs before Jesus or after him. Uh, and in the end of the Middle Age, beginning of modernity, and so on, Sabbatai Svi, and whatever their names are. So, Parousia delay means that the coming of the Messiah is delayed. Now, other people may say it's not delayed, it will just not come. So, um, the, uh, uh, if you go to a mosque, the Messiah will come, and it will be the Jesus Messiah, but he will not be divine. He will be something like uh, David, or uh, Jewish king who will bring peace and so on. Also for the Jews it's not divine. So um, the incarnation in John, the first chapter in John, is the stumbling block between the three religions, right, where the uh, Muslims and the Jews cannot go along with this. They said, Muhammad would say in the first surahs, you are exaggerating, you are making too much of Jesus. Jesus was a messenger, he was a great prophet and so on, but he was not God and so on. So this divinity thing that uh, makes it, you know, that's why we are apart in spite of the fact that it's the same faith community, it's the same Abrahamic faith. So in that sense Eckhart is an idealist, right? For Eckhart nature is immediate but it is also mediated. That means it's created. It's created through the word and so on. And the question is, can we reach this what is there before nature? Now, what all our universities do, they operate on the level of analytical understanding, which cannot go beyond nature and the object of nature. So, therefore, they can say we're atheists, but they cannot prove it. So, therefore, they rather say we are agnostics. There could be something but we cannot reach that something and we cannot say anything about that something. While Meister Eckhart thinks 
that with philosophy and with science and with the uh, uh, Torah and with the New Testament and with the Holy Quran, it is possible to say something positive about God. And this is called the via positiva, a positive way. You can see how God expresses his Trinitarian logic in physics, in mechanics, in the family, in civil society, in the state, and so on. That is via uh, positiva. And then there is a via negativa, negative way, where you have to get rid of all that nature and all that man and what he has created in order to see that what is before nature and so on. And he thinks that he can find that in an unbelievably dialectical, and this is a strange word, uh, procedure. Unfortunately, we have repressed dialectics here together with Hegel, together with Freud, together with Marx, and therefore we have been the losers. It would have been better to defend Christianity with Hegel, for instance. Uh, but we gave all that up because we gave it up because dialectical thinking means that you think in opposites. So when you think about Kalamazoo, you think about Kalamazoo on one side of the railroad station and Kalamazoo on the other side of the railroad station. On one side you have miserable houses, not real beds in it. On the other side you have million dollar homes where the police has to watch them all day long and so on. So this antagonism. So during the Great Depression, we repressed dialectical thinking. And Meister Eckhart is that great dialectician. <laughs> and we thought it would destabilize people. So the economy was already destabilized. And we thought it wouldn't be good if they would be stabilized in their thinking as well. And so we wiped it out from all the schools, high schools, and so on. Before that, we had Hegelians in Philadelphia, and we had Hegels in St. Louis and um, who built our high school system. And my children's grandfather in New Haven and so on had an excellent high school uh, education and what we are now is in shambles. So you cannot deny great people all the time and hope that you will replace them all or do what they, what thousands of years have established uh, suddenly to rid oneself of all of that and, and then think it will go well. So. Let me just say where Meister Eckhart comes into this whole thing. There were these two institutes I just mentioned, and in one of them there was the uh, um, Eric Fromm, who is very famous in this country, and you have innumerable books, and online I just found out that my students, you know, wrote beautifully about him, so it is learnable, it can be learned. And the uh, real founder of this um, Frankfurt Institute there was Karl Landauer, uh, Karl Landauer was dealt particularly with emotions in some, and um, of course he had, when the Nazis came in, he had to leave. He went to Holland, and Horkheimer wanted to bring him over here to, uh, to New York and rescue him, but he didn't want to, so he was caught by the Nazis and died in a concentration camp, um, and turned died, uh, starved to death, and so on. So, um, so we have this one institute, and, and uh, it was particularly Eric Fromm then who slowly um, came to know Master Eckhart better. But before that, let me say after the war, this institute came back to Frankfurt and um, it was refounded and there were people called Michelich, Michelich who did something very interesting that you see what they are doing there and that was they wanted to help the Germans with their inability to mourn, their inability to mourn. When something horrible happens, people should be able to mourn. When the 20 children were killed recently, I think there was some mourning going on about this. So, but the Germans in 1945 and later on were not able to mourn about the concentration camps and the six million Jews killed or gassed and so on and the whole uh, 70 million uh, uh, Russians killed and murdered and so on. They could not mourn. And so Mitchell, his husband and wife, uh, spent the whole rest of their lives there in order to help the Germans. Uh, even when the Germans paid massively back to the state of Israel, they just paid it 
functionalistically in a certain sense. Um, when I, uh, I went there again, I went to Israel and saw the whole thing, there was no heart in it. They said, well, it's good, you know, diplomatically and worldwide that we pay the stuff and so on, we have enough. Uh, but there was no mourning, there was no sin, sadness, there was no repentance. And I must say to you honestly that I'm shocked that we are not saying anything about the one million people we have killed in Iraq. We are so concerned about the embryos uh, which are aborted and so on, but what do you think how many embryos died in living women who were incinerated and, and so on. This, uh, why is there no feeling of sadness or mourning that this has happened? Or in, 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 uh, uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan and so on. Uh, so the, uh, there is something in the modern society, it's not only us, it's not only the Germans, it is, uh, it is widespread in the modern civilization that people think, well that happened but I have nothing to do with it, so don't bother me with it and uh, I don't have to repent. Well, I pay taxes for it, that's the least I did, so I should think about something. But if I would go to the confessional up there, where by the way the picture of my wife is in there, um, and would confess I have killed one million people, Father Ken wouldn't know what to do with me. He would pro probably send me to the state hospital or whatever. So this, um, we just, so that is what these Michelis were about. They wanted to help the Germans to mourn and to see what they have done and what they were responsible for. And, uh, well, I don't think they were too successful in the end. Okay, so, so this was one side, and, and the other side we had this other institute, and uh, that was more the Marx, and this is also a very bad name for us, and uh, it was a bad name for the fascists, that's why all these people had to die there. Um, so let's say for a moment what, was, what these two were about. Um, when you, let me just read something, um, what Marx wrote when he was in the Abitur, he made a high school exam, and uh, so he wrote about religion there. Uh, let me see if I find that somewhere. Uh, the, uh, yeah, let me see, because what we are running against there in terms of Freud and Marx, we, we cannot see that there may be some, some here for instance, Marx wrote um, in, this, uh, in his dissertation there about uh, when he ended up the high school there. Marx now, when we consider the history of the individual or the nature of man, we see admittedly always a spark of divinity, doesn't sound like atheism, in his chest, an enthusiasm for the good, a striving for knowledge, a longing for the truth, alone the sparks of the eternal are suffocated by the flame of desire, passion and greed. The enthusiasm for the virtue is stunned and stilled, anesthetized and overpowered by the tempting voice of sin. It is mocked and sneered at as soon as the life has let us feel its whole power. The striving for knowledge is repressed by a low striving for earthly goods. The longing, there is the having thing. The striving for the knowledge is repressed by a low striving for earthly goods, having, having type. The longing uh, for the truth is extinguished through the sweetly flattering power of the lie, advertisement, propaganda, etc. And so man stands there, the only being in nature which does not fulfill its purpose, the only member in the universe of creation who is not worthy of the God who created it. Now, that, that doesn't sound like atheism, does it? So that means we are struggling with things which were put on these people, and we see that here Eckhart's teaching of having, and there's something else, you know. That means Marx has this being in mind, and this being is repressed by this having, 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 and so on. That is the illness. So, um, and we have similar things also in Freud. So, why I want to, uh, the, uh, the, for instance, in a newspaper article, I can just mention that uh, to, uh, because he, uh, Marx was a Jew, but he had been baptized, a Lutheran, right? You oh, know that's that. where it was. 
Because I thought he was, didn't he have a Protestant father? Or, because Protestant no, no, they were, they were Jewish, but they converted they con to Protestantism. Yeah, yeah right, yeah. Okay. So, but here, um, okay. Okay, so, uh, but we will come to, to that uh, later on. So, the, the question is what I mentioned, you know, there is this creation theology is the positive way. That means we see God creating and we see his mind, his logic in everything. What you have with Marx and Freud is that they go, go another way, namely the via negativa. There's a whole tradition of negative theology not to say what God is, but what is God is not. And so what Marx and Freud attack is the idolatry of the market. It is not the real religion. It is not the good religion. What is the difference between good and bad religion? Bad religion consoles people and at the same time it snuffs out their conscience. It plunts their conscience. I kill one million people and Christ is my savior. Are you sure he is your savior after all that killing? Are you sure he's a savior when you leave 40 million people in the slums? Or when you leave, see, even now after Obamacare, there's still 10 million people without health insurance and so on. So that means evil religion is religion which consoles in such a way that it blunts the conscience. Good religion, is religion which consoles. We all need consolation, but in such a way that our conscience is sharpened. And this does not come from Marx, and this does not come from Hegel, that comes from Kant, the great teacher of all of them, who in his uh, theory of religion uh, made this definition and it went on then. It was taken over by Hegel, and Hegel thought that uh, Hinduism was opiate religion. That's where this opiate comes from. Opiate or bad religion is religion which uh, uh, consoles in order to, uh, uh, to plant the conscience. So Kant would say when you die uh, and you call some priest in still or minister or so, don't do that in order to console you. Let them come in in order to tell you what good you can still do what you can still do about this son who was alienated from you, or what you can still do in the last minute, something good, in order to, uh, to uh, you know, correct something or whatever. So this is what we have about this atheism. The atheism in Freud and so on is an attack against a false religion, against an opiate religion, a religion which blunts the conscience so you Christians, you say, you know, poverty, but then when your poverty is attacked, you go to court. And so that is what Marx says all the time. He took his uh, children to church still, to a Catholic church in London. And uh, the children wanted to know why they go. And he said, well, the music, it's beautiful music. And then the children said, what is all the music about? And he said, there were once, there was once a man, there was once a poor man, and the rich people murdered him. If you read the New Testament where Jesus says in John, for instance, you are not the children of Abraham. You want to kill me, and therefore you are not the children of Abraham. You want to kill me, therefore you are not the children of Yahweh. You are the children of Satan, and so on. So that means there was once a poor man, and the rich people wanted to murder, not wanted to, murder him. That is a wonderful Christology. And then the uh, children, and he said to his children too, we can forgive Christianity a lot because it gave us the worship of the child. It gave us the worship of the child. And uh, Marx had a wonderful relationship to children when he was sitting in the London slums there in the park. They all came and pulled on his big beard he had, so, um, and also to his own uh, children, uh, so as a witness which they gave later on. So. So we have to uh, see the, the, why Eckhart was excommunicated and why we excommunicate Marx and why we don't want to have Freud. Uh, when I came here, they fired the last Freudian in the psychology department and they fired the last two Bakuninists Bakuninist in the economics department. Why are we doing this? 
the uh, uh, Freud is digging in the basement of our psyche. There are uncomfortable things in this psyche. Otherwise, this murder would not come out all the time. And this porno would not come out all the time. So that is what we are suffering from. And he's digging down into this and shows it to us. What's wrong with this? And he has learned from his psychology a lot from Jewish mysticism and, and so on. And uh, with Marx, the same way, he goes in the basement of the, uh, of the, economy, of the civil society. And this base, basement is economics. It's economic stupid. That's what it's about. Why the hell did we go to Vietnam? There was robber. The Michelin robber company, we took it all over. So why did we get to El Salvador and, and initiate that civil war there? Where 70,000 people died, including Romero and the priests and so on. There's coffee there, cheap coffee. And why did we go to Iraq? Of course, there is, we have now, we own two thirds of the oil wells in Iraq. And one third has to be shared by three parties in Iraq. And they never agree to it, but uh, you can't help it. So, um, uh, and, and so this is the, uh, um, that is, we must ask ourselves, why do we rid ourselves of people who could possibly help us in this miserable situation in which we are? Or we don't see that it's a miserable situation in which we are. I don't think that when, when the econ economists came to uh, President Bush and said the economy is going over the brink, I don't think that Americans understood what that meant or what it still means. So if they had done the same thing if the other party had won and they would have gone back to Friedmanianism and separated itself from Keynes and they would have uh, um, the, uh, the regulated and privatized further, two years later people would have come to Omni and would have said the economy is going over the brink and so on. So it is hovering on the brink <coughs> still. So therefore in, in, in Germany the, uh, when, when that catastrophe happened, the finance capitalism collapse, they went to the library and took Marx's book about uh, crisis theory and said, well, he knew it all, he saw it all, so maybe we can learn from him. That is an attitude which is ha halfway normal. But why kicking, I mean, it's, the neurotic does that usually. He kicks the psychoanalyst wants to kill him and so on. The more he comes to the truth, uh, the more uncomfortable it becomes the more he doesn't want to go anymore. So there is a certain rejection of those who uh, could reveal. But if you don't reveal it, you cannot really uh, uh, change it. So, and um, what I want to say is that Eckhart is behind both of them. For, uh, Eckhart was a dialectical thinker. I mean, say, we said what that was, to think in terms of opposites and to reconcile these opposites. Now. Our sciences can see the opposites, but they don't talk much about it because they have no hope to overcome that. Or, in other words, all dualisms are bad. The dualism between men and women, the dualism between the classes. And somehow people think these dualisms have to be there, or they were ever there. They were not always there. And they can be overcome. So dialectical thinking means to cancel the dualisms. It is not right that our women on campus have less for the same job. Uh, that has to be overcome. That is an old, old dualism which has to be overcome. And we had it with the race and so on. And uh, wherever you have this alienation, which is a Marxist word, the unfreer you are. A free society is one which has overcome the alienation between the generations and the genders and the classes and the races and so on. So the more alienation there is, the less freedom there is. We cannot call ourselves a free country if we are not conquering these alienations, these dualisms. So um, they also we have it also in Catholicism, uh, the dualism of, uh, of St. Augustine uh, in sexuality between the body and the soul and between men and women. Um, if you read the Confessions of St. Augustine, who is quoted all the time by Eckhart, uh, the, uh, uh, he uh, had uh, lived in the concubinage and for nine years and then he sent his wife away back to Africa and he doesn't even mention her name. In, he mentioned the name of the son Adeodatus given by God through a concubinage but he never mentions uh, her, her name. And so this dualism has gone into Christian morality and has 
but used this disaster in terms of uh, ethical, uh, uh, sexual ethics. <coughs> okay, so let me sum it up very shortly. The, um, um, the, we want to know in which sense Master Eckhart, who comes from the Roman Catholic paradigm, uh, so we have the uh, Jewish Christian Christianity, then we have the Orthodox Christianity, Roman Catholic, where this belongs to here, that is the third paradigm of Christianity, then comes the Protestant paradigm of Christianity, then comes the Enlightenment paradigm of Christianity, Schleiermacher, and then comes the present one, the ecumenical paradigm of uh, Christianity. And I tried to bring that here. I invited uh, Hans Küng, who was here, and I invited Metz, who was here, in order to uh, get us into this uh, sixth type of paradigm. So we have made all the attempts here uh, uh, possible in order to go forward and move forward. Okay, so, um, but the, we, call, we talked about two institutes now uh, in Frankfurt. One uh, brought into modernity Freud and the other one brought into modernity Marx. And what Fromm did, he combined Marx and Fromm and so did Marcuse and so did uh, Reich and, and others did this. But then Fromm went on and he discovered suddenly that there is much more to be won uh, there uh, in terms of Master Eckhart. Um, from when he was in that institute, he was in both, he made a study in Germany about workers. So he had 8,000 workers and he wanted to know if they were authoritarian or fascist personalities or if they were revolutionary, uh, socialistic uh, personalities. And he found out that about 12 or 15 percent were on one side, the other one were on the other side. And during the war I found out that there were always a few workers who were fanatic fascists and then others who were in opposition to fascism were put into concentration camps and so on. So, by the way, we are not uh, simply out of that picture. I went to a colleague of mine into his house and I told him, I said, you know, uh, I described to him what an authoritarian personality is, romantic, the good old times are the past, uh, nationalistic, right around my country, uh, capitalistic, Ford, Henry Ford was a fascist. He had the workers, 70,000 he had together there and had thugs to beat him up when they were not functioning well. He got a decoration from Hitler and so on. So, um, so the authoritarian person, and he said, and, and then of course the authoritarian personality is sadistic, likes to make people suffer, and he's also masochistic. He takes a lot of suffering upon himself as well, as you can see in Hitler. And so, so um, this, uh, and, and then this colleague of mine said, "You cannot tell me in my own house that I'm a fascist." I said, "I didn't tell you that you are a fascist. I just described what a fascist personality is." So we have masses of them here as well. And from did make this study in order to know if fascism would have a chance or not because you need a lot of uh, authoritarian personalities in order to make a transition from liberalism to fascism. And uh, they, the studies were quite, uh, quite adequate. It, it was never verified scientifically, but from my uh, experience there through these 12 years, I think uh, it came very close to that. So, uh, nevertheless, this, uh, uh, um, then the, the authoritarian personality and the uh, he called it later on the democratic personality, uh, changed then into the having personality, the authoritarian personality became a having personality, and the other one, the democratic, became into a being personality. And being means that all the energy which we have, our seeing, our hearing, our touching, and so on, all that constitutes being. So therefore, from at the end, he talks about this city of being, is that the city of God of which Augustine speaks and the city of progress which goes into a chaos, they are both superseded into the city of being. That was his, his uh, issue then, so in which also having will be superseded into being. Okay, so then Fromm's works there, I put some up and you see that he uh, uh, was from the very beginning uh, he was in the School of Learning in Frankfurt. You may know this Martin Buber. He was a mystic, a Jewish mystic. He studied particularly the Hasidim and, and the Kabbalah. Another one is Sholem, but he doesn't come up here. So uh, later then 
from, moved from Jewish mysticism into Christian mysticism, and that is where Eckhart comes into the picture then. Then he wrote his dissertation on the Jewish law in the city of Heidelberg, and then he also wrote a story on Sabbath. You see, he was deeply uh, rooted in the Jewish tradition, and uh, then he uh, had a lecture, he gave a lecture on the application of the psychoanalysis to sociology and religiology from, from combined then Marx and Freud and wanted to find out in which way the psychic apparatus had caused or determined the social development of society. He also did this German workers thing which I just mentioned in 1929. But the issue is how does this authoritarian personality, that fascist personality come into existence, the family of course. So it isn't the family where the authoritarian father but uses these little authoritarian guys. And uh, then out of the authoritarian family comes the authoritarian state. So the question is now not only to uh, <coughs> think theologically but to apply this at the same time to psychology and to sociology as well. Um, then the study of authority and family, he did that together with Hawker and Marcuse and so on. It was another study and uh, it had to be done in exile already. And finally he uh, wrote something on the dogma of Christ. <coughs> so he wanted to know how this uh, teaching on not only Jesus of Nazareth, but how Jesus of Nazareth became the Christ. Jesus called himself only the Son of Man from Daniel. He never called himself the Son of God or um, uh, any other title. All the titles were given to him by his friends, by the community after his death. So um, the, um, what, what uh, Fromm does, he uh, <coughs> studies the um, psychological conditions <coughs> of these early Christians and where they live. And um, there were not many uh, rich people in the Christian community. Most of them were workers, most of them were slaves and so on. So, um, and uh, so this, the liberating power, what made Christianity so tremendously attractive that uh, 300 years later it became the state religion of Rome and why did that happen? So that is the study which from it was republished in 1992, so you can look at it and so on. So then we have uh, the culture wars here, I put something up there and we can divide them up and I mentioned a few already where Eckhart could help us through from, through Marx, through anybody else who, uh, who was, um, uh, is, is, has, uh, comes from Eckhart. So we have the dimension of the family. Uh, what can we do in terms of the family so that she doesn't produce, doesn't produce these types which then lead us from liberalism to fascism. And the um, in, in civil society, which means the need system, administration of justice and so on. That's what we live in between the state and the family. Our civil society has developed unbelievably while the state has not sufficiently developed and that is in the discussion every day. The state including then eternal law, external law and history and so on and then history including God's reason. So that is what, uh, um, what um, the uh, mystics still believed that history is led by God, that God is reason and that's what the Catholic Church believes still and that all the events which take place are not simply chaos, nonsense and so on, but that they follow a plan and that this plan goes to a certain purpose. Um, and uh, so you can also be invited to look at my website there where all this is uh, uh, somehow spelled out a little bit. Um, and then what we want to do when we meet is to do a time diagnosis. That means we want to take one of these culture wars and want to discuss it through and see to what extent Eckhart can be, be helpful. So we want to see on one side this great theologian on one side who has uh, somehow influenced so many others and on the other side we want to see where we are. And if we get those two things together, when we talks about being instead of having, at the same time we live in a having society, can there be anything done about this or whatever in the family, in civil society, in the state, in international relations or whatever. Um, when we say, I have in St. Petersburg there, uh, I gave him something on, this, on the, on the um, Golden Rule, um, and I'm there, the scholar of the Golden Rule, 
um, why can we not apply the golden rule? Treat other nations as you want to be treated. Why can we not treat other nations as we want to be treated? We don't, don't want to have automatic uh, airplanes flying all over the place and assassin 250 people a month or whatever. It's unthinkable that we want wish that for ourselves. But why do we do this to other people? Well, because they are so bad, the other people. Well, but what if they think that we are bad? That is what Bin Laden, of course, said in his books on September 11th. We wanted to give the Americans a taste of what they are doing to other people. You know that Bin Laden was in Boston, he studied there, and he met a lot of gentle Americans. He talks about these gentle Americans, but are we following the golden rule? And if we are not, then that shouldn't stop there, the discourse. But we should ask, you know, why can't we do that? What is it? Also, you know, personally, personal life, why can't we treat other people how we, not how we really treat it, that would be bad, but how we would like to be treated, that is the Sermon of the Mount, that the Taoists have, the Hindus have, the Chinese have, the uh, Buddhists have, everybody, the Muslims have it, and so on. So the, the question is not that we don't have it, but why can't we practice it? What is it psychoanalytically which makes it impossible for us? And what is it economically or sociologically which makes it impossible for us to follow those beautiful things which we all agree, obviously all the world religions agree that this is a beautiful way to live. It could be heaven on earth. But why is it not present? What is the curse? What is the ban that we cannot move and cannot do it otherwise? This week again, uh, drones will fly into people's territories and we'll just pick them out and it's called non-judicial assassinations. Non-judicial means it has not been okayed by any court whatsoever. Not the world court, not the American courts, nothing. These are state crimes. They are much worse than individual ones. They are bad enough. But if the state backs up crimes and I mean, one thing is, you know, if you say to people they want to kill us, then you can do exactly what you want to. You know who said this? Goering, the guy whom you saw there, the big guy, that was Goering. He survived and was in Nuremberg trial, and he talked for two weeks, and he said, all what you have to tell people is that they are threatened. When they are threatened, you can get them all into wars. It doesn't matter if they are fascists or liberals or communists or whatever, they will all march. So that would be a psychoanalytical thing, you know, what is that, this fear monitoring there, which they do continually, you know, and what is really with these, what is real about these fears and what not. So uh, the, um, uh, Master Eckhart was, uh, like all the other uh, uh, mystics, they are very deeply rooted in, uh, in, in their, they are psychologists. Now why do we not here, we have Skinner here on this campus, why don't we say, you know, these mystics are deep psychologists and Dostoevsky was a great psychologist and Tolstoy and so on. You know, there's only one reason. We cannot be certain about what they say. That means we don't know how Master Eckhart knew so much about the soul and God and we have lost both of them together. So therefore Skinner says there's a black box in there. And then come the cognitivists and they say there's a box and the box and the box and then you have suddenly not only one black box, you have a lot of black boxes. And you know nothing about the soul and nothing about God neither. A God knew something about him, but they, they come sometimes and they would like to use a methodology of the Buddhists uh, in order to condition people. I have a friend over there, he has a thing here, whenever he has a nasty thought, he pushes and the thorn goes into his flesh. So in that way he conditions himself to have good thoughts. Now he thinks the Buddhists can help them, help him. But I always tell him, you have to become a Buddhist in order to do that well. You cannot just take the methods, the tools and nothing else. It's not, it doesn't work. So, and then he comes again a few years later and uh, then wants to have the same thing. <clears throat> okay, so um, we, the, the reason is why why these deep insights into the psyche 
um, and into society, why we cannot listen to those things is we want to have proof. So that means you put a little rat into a box and put electricity on one side and food on the other side. Then it runs back and forth, then you have the proof. And it's not enough to kill one, one rat, you have to kill a lot of them all the time. We had a psychologist, the head of the department, he was a Mennonite, and he went home to his mother, and uh, the mother said, boy, what are you doing with your life? He said, I'm studying the relationship <coughs> between pain and aggression. <coughs> and the mother said, your grandfather talked about that all the time. And so he came back and said, why, when my grandfather knew about this all, why, why do I have to kill all these little rats? So then one day I went with him to these buildings over there, they're still there, and uh, we let all the doves fly and all the mice run <laughs> until the police came and, uh, and it didn't, didn't help very much. They had, have new ones, they couldn't move through cages. So. But I mean, we want to understand both sides because these are all intelligent people and so when, when we say, look, there is, there is this whole treasure of things which could help us now, <coughs> but they want to be really certain and they are certain only when it is there with their senses, when they can see it and they don't even believe that the birds go up there with a the purpose and make a little nest <clears throat> because they can see the purpose. They can only see that they carry that stuff up there, but they don't know why they carry that stuff up there, so they cancel the whole teleological causation in the 18th century. And that has something to do, by the way, with the discussion, you know, of uh, uh, abortion and why abortion is murder and why um, if, if they would reintroduce the idea of teleology one could say that the embryo from the very beginning has a purpose to get out there, not only the moment it's born but already before, uh, but it's not there. So that is where our discourse stops. But that doesn't mean to kill the other guy, but it means to keep the discourse open on both sides because both sides are changing. And so we can get out of this unbelievable misery in which we find ourselves.